It's my pleasure to be here. Can you believe that coming from the state of Vermont, I have never been to Rhode Island? <laughs> I know, this is like an awesome admission to, to, to do at the front, at, uh, front end of a talk, but I'm driving down yesterday and thinking how pretty it is, almost like a postcard in terms of, of that drive, you know, through uh, Providence on I-95, just before you get down to here, I'm like, why did it take me 21 years? So hopefully this is the beginning of, of something new that I'd love to come back and, and work with you all some more in, in terms of, of some of the things that we both have sort of shared interest in. So they always say to start off with uh, a great slide. And the things that we're going to be talking about today have to do with severe weather, which is one of my passions, and the ways in which um, severe weather, be they tornadoes or particularly hurricanes, actually sort of intersect with us as human beings, because that's where the vulnerability piece comes in. And how do we actually make choices that reduce our vulnerability? Well, part of it has to do with understanding the, the science behind what some of the, the storm systems look like, but some of it also has to do with our exposure and the choices that we make as, as human beings. So a lot about what we're going to talk a little bit about this afternoon has to do with, with hurricanes and, and tropical systems, but I don't want to forget some of the other severe weather that we have in place. So we're kind of going to step on through and look at some of these and actually sort of tease out what are some of the, the current understandings. Some of this is literally hot off the press, I kid you not, it's less than six days old. And then what are some of the, the pieces that we still have to understand a little bit about severe weather and severe events. And you know, if, if you're students in the room and you're thinking maybe of a, a project for next semester, or still trying to tease out what you're going to do with your dissertation or your thesis, um, some of the pieces that are still, um, that we're still trying to understand what the dynamics are. And they're all considered to be hazards in, in the sense that they exist and they exist naturally. Now, part of the next phase in all of this is when those natural hazards intersect with us as human beings. And that's where the sort of risk part comes in because it's our exposure as human beings to either a blizzard or our exposure to a tropical system or if you think about the, the road that we just drove down here, okay, our exposure to tidal flooding, that's the other piece that we can look at. And that part is the risk of the hazard. Okay? Now, when our exposure comes together with a particular event and it causes either a tremendous or unfortunate loss of life or damage or something else that Im impacts us as human beings and our human system, our societal system, then we know that we've moved into a disaster. Okay, so just off the bat, we're going to make sure that when we talk about hazards and disaster, they're not equivalent, but when a hazard becomes extreme to the, 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 the point that we either have a loss of life or we have some sort of um, event where we need to have um, losses being reimbursed, then we have a disaster in place. Okay, so keeping that in mind, let's see um, this, this sort of inter intersection, which is one of the things that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change really, really took to heart in the, the 2011 report that they put out in looking at how some of these pieces where they intersect here with the actual event itself and our exposure, when that comes into place, when these two interact, then we can actually look at our human vulnerabilities and the, the geographies of vulnerabilities in terms of where we live, in terms of pieces like race and ethnicity and access and language and how all of those various pieces sort of come together for us. So I'm about to fail PowerPoint 101 because I can guarantee you the folks at the back cannot see this or read this. Am I correct? Okay. So we have a map on the left-hand side of the U.S. Can you see that there are places where the shading is darker orange and then it gets lighter orange? Okay. So what we're looking at is the gradation and you've got your, your legend on the top here. Okay, you've got your legend on the top there where we're going from light colors to dark colors, from less to more, all right? And so the darker regions, the darkest colors that we're looking at here show you the places where you've had the most losses by zip code. So any place that's a dark orange has had the most um, losses by zip code. 
Both of these diagrams, both the one on the left-hand side here and the one on the right-hand side, are what are known as presidential disaster declarations. And why we look at those is because when an event has become not just a hazard, when it's become a, a disaster, either loss of life, limb, or property, then if, if it reaches the proportion that the governor of a state can actually make a request for resources, be it the National Guard or monetary resources, that's called a presidential disaster declaration. Okay? And so the places that you see that are really, really orange have had quite a number of those different types of disaster declarations over the last few years. And so there are a lot of, of concentrations in the West, which would be th due to things like wildfires, and then across the southern tier in here, and those would be due to things like a combination of freeze events or hurricanes and so forth. And then on the right-hand side here, um, are some of the different types of events that have led to these disaster declarations. So uh, to make sure that you can see what some of these words are, they include things like severe storms and floods, hurricanes and snow events, tornadoes and fires, ice storms and freezes. And you see there's a certain spatial component to the types of disaster declarations. So they seem to be in certain parts of the U.S. In, in looking at who's been particularly prone or who's been particularly vulnerable to some of these events. So that's the where. This slide shows you the when. And in the when, so it's the same disaster declaration stuff, in the when, we're looking at two different things in here. You've got the most recent events, so 2017, up in this lower, in this upper left-hand corner. And then we've got the furthest back in time, which is 2002, down in this lower right-hand corner in here. That's the first thing that you're looking at. So that's the when, going back in time as we go down through. The other thing that you're looking at when you look at that diagram, do you see some, some circles? All right. And do you see some circles are smaller and some circles are bigger? So the bigger the circle, the more um, of a declaration that was. Okay? So you're looking to see when were there lots and lots of declarations for certain parts. And you'll notice that 2017, we had quite a number in here. And those would be things like Irma and, and Maria and so forth. And then you also had another big bullseye down in 2005, which would have been um, Katrina and Rita and Wilma. All right. So we're looking at those in there. Now, put those two dates aside. You'll notice that there are other times and we've had <laughs> additional um, large concentrations, like 2008 across in here. And those are in the central part of the country. And those would be not necessarily tropical cyclones, but things like severe storms, severe thunderstorms, which can produce a significant amount of damage, but we may not always remember to include them in what we're looking at. Okay, so we've got some of these patterns that we're looking at in here. Now, one other way to sort of slice and dice this is how often or how frequently or how many tend to occur. And when you look at this graph, the first thing that is the largest number on here is severe storms. Would you have thought about that as the biggest thing that usually gets, gets um, a lot of these uh, declarations? Severe storms? If, if I had put this up and, and hurricanes was number one, then you would have been like this, right? Okay? But severe storms, be they winter storms or storms that occur in the fall or storms that occur in, in the springtime, those are all critically important in terms of some of these disaster declarations, but they not, may not necessarily get the same, um, sorry to do this bad pun, they may not get the same press. Sorry, folks, along the third row here. They may not get the same sort of press as some of the other events, which are, are a little bit um, more mundane. Okay? So we're looking to see what are some of these in here. And so floods, number three on here. And we kind of go on down through the line to look at, at what are the, the types that tend to occur over and over again. So that sort of begs the question. Is there any place in the world that is safe from disaster? Is there any place in the world where a hazard 
um, becomes a disaster that is, is completely safe to live? And the answer is probably no, okay? So we're thinking about disasters, we're thinking about extreme events, and we're thinking, how do we get to a disaster? How do we get to an extreme event? What's the threshold? What's our definition? What's our criteria? And we can think of things like, is it the 90th percentile? or the 10% in terms of a really cold event? Or is it something that occurs once in 500 year return interval? Or is it something that is unprecedented in the entire history of records that we have? Or is it something that is specific to a location and might be an extreme event for Narragansett Bay that is not an extreme event for Burlington, Vermont? Okay, so there are a number of ways of trying to figure out what uh, our definition is in here. So to answer that question, is any place free of, of disasters? And the answer is probably no. So as I'm going through, I'm going to try and use this as a, as a tool and a device. I see some of you taking notes. So if you're, if you're thinking about going and finding out more about this stuff, here's your first piece. Okay, the first piece in here is the World Meteorological Organization the WMO, it's based in Geneva in Switzerland. They put out these climate um, reports, these statements every year, and this is the one that summarizes all of the, the major events across the entire globe for 2017. And you're reading this and you're kind of looking and you're looking at uh, the fact that there were things like bleaching events in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. You're looking at the floods that took place in Asia. You're looking at the wildfires and they were not just in California and Alaska, but also around the world. And then you're also seeing this last piece in here that says uh, the most costly hurricane season, okay? So when we look at that, and we think about some of the events that contributed to that 2017 hurricane season being some of the, the, the costliest. We think about the, the, the damages that resulted from hur hurricanes Harvey, Maria, Irma as, as part of that contributor in there. Okay, So let's see what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So there are a couple of things that um, you've, you've gotten the sense of that are going to be themes for the things that we cover. And so I wanted to sort of lay this out a little bit for, for us. If you don't remember anything else from the next 30 or so minutes that I talk about, the one thing that I want you to take away is the word systems, okay? Whether it's a human system, whether it's a physical system, whether it's the interaction or the interplay between a human system and a physical system, okay? Now, why, why am I big, so big on systems? Well, all of the, the, the parts of the natural world, whether it's the air, whether it's how the air interacts with the, the, the vegetation and trees, whether it's how the oceans interact with the land, all of those kind of work together, right? And all of these are, are interconnected in one way, so that if you miss something going on in the ocean, you're going to miss something going on in land. Are you with me? So when you think about the, the, the hazards and the disasters that we're talking about and thinking about, systems is really, really big in here. Okay? So the next thing that we need to really think about, and this is easy for us who live in New England, is you can't do anything without understanding the shape of the land, the topography. Because a lot of the, the severe events that we have here are either going to be enhanced by when they hit a slope and they're forced to rise, or again, being on, on the, 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 the shore of, of Narragansett Bay, it's, it's easy for us to actually think about the land and how that kind of influences us here. So that's a couple of things in here. The next things that we're going to take a look at is when are we talking about, so the time frame, and where are we talking about, also critically important. And we're going to be using all of these to understand the observations that people make, how do we use those observations to create models or representations of, of the land? And then we will talk a little bit about um, feedbacks. Hopefully I can start walking up and down the aisle. Can I? Since I have a roving mic, I can walk up and down the aisle. See, I was not supposed to move beyond this line of lights. Okay? So if I do like this and I talk about feedbacks, we're good. 
right? So what are some of the feedbacks that we can talk about from a, a client perspective? How do we deal with this notion of uncertainty? Uncertainty is not a bad thing. How do we as scientists work with that? And then what are some of the things that we still need to understand a little bit like El Nino, La Nina, heard about those, right? North Atlantic Oscillation, keep shaking your head. Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, Stop shaking your head for that one. <laughs> no? All right. So there are these things called teleconnections that we will talk a little bit about. Where does science get all of its information from? Well, a lot of it has to do with observations. And observations can take many, many different shapes and forms, whether it is, you know, you've probably got buoys on, on Narragansett Bay, and you look and see the tidal um, flows up and down. Uh, they're probably um, other measuring and monitoring um, devices and operations and installations. I'm a climatologist, so I spend a lot of my time uh, working with satellite images. This is the ice storm of 1998. And then we also um, use things like different types of computer models to help us understand what's taking place. And I guarantee you, if I was giving this talk 20 years ago, I wouldn't have included that word. Social media, because social media and crowdsourcing has now sort of revolutionized the way in which we get information because everybody has some sort of device or a lot of folks have some sort of device and what's the natural inclination? Whip it out, got the location on, you start tracking stuff, taking your pictures, sending in a lot of that information and so that's revolutionized the way that we can actually verify and validate a lot of the, the models that we're actually looking at. Okay, so that's where a lot of our information comes from nowadays. Now, what about 150 years ago? Where did our information come from then? And a lot of the information back in, in, in 200, 300 years ago came from written accounts. And so I do a lot of historical climatology, and a gold mine for me is when I find one of these um, diaries that folks used to have. They're, they're about yay big. They were designed to sort of fit in your back pocket. And in there, you kept a record of everything that you did that day. But you also kept a record of, do you see where it says weather on the top there? These were designed for you to actually write down what the weather was. So whether it was 53 degrees and it snowed that day, you, you could actually use these to sort of build a, a track record through time. So that's great. Now, where else can you get information from back in time in terms of weather and climate? Well, there are lots and lots of pictures that show you things like, you know the falls? The New England and the mills and the falls and all that, another way of sort of getting our, our data. Things like sugar mapling, if you're a little bit further north, is one other place. And here's, here's another one that you may not have thought about. Stuff that's captured in art or poetry, like Robert Frost. Okay, or um, Frankenstein was written in a particularly cold period and sort of captures some of the stuff that was taking place around then. So we have the humanities that allow us a really, really rich source of, of looking at those data currently. So I don't know if it, it was the same thing here in, in Rhode Island as it was in, in Vermont. Did you have a, a January that the temperatures did like this? Did you have that same thing? Okay, so you had a lot of swings and it got really, really warm and then it went back cold. All right, so we had a lot of those swings across at least some of New England here. And what usually follows when you have this sort of up and down and up and down in, in January is that by the time you get down to March all the way through June, you notice how the temperature went in the opposite direction and the last couple of weeks were a little bit on the cool side. And now it's starting to warm up again. That's called a backward spring. So it's going in the opposite direction to what it, it usually would do. So a backward spring or a backward season. And this diagram, if I took off 1832 and put 2018 or 2017, it would look very, very similar. Okay? So I thought that I had come up with something brand new, only to discover somebody beat me to 200 years ago when they said a summerish January a winterish spring. So it's something that when we, th we think about climate variability and change, 
how do we kind of uh, make sense of observations that we're seeing today that may have been replicated in the past? And how, has things, how have things changed over time? So if I have all of these wonderful written records or records that come to us from, from art, and I have satellite images and different types of, of monitoring today, how can I actually use that in a continuous framework? And so to do that, um, there are scientists who work on creating a, a standardized way of, of actually cr looking at these records over time so that you can compare 2018 with something that took place in 1888, for example. And so we can look at, at the, the ways in which we can account for changes in the techniques, changes in the instruments, changes in how things might have been uh, from one time frame to the next. Now, one of the things that's different in 2018 that they didn't have back in 1888 or even 1990 is, you ever notice when you pull up a map on your phone or your computer or your laptop, it's uh, a map that shows you the landscape in the background? Yes or no, you know what I'm talking about? A little bit? Okay, I'll show you when I get to it, okay? So it's this integration of the landscape from a geospatial perspective that has now become so common that we don't think about it. But I guarantee you, 1960, this talk wouldn't have seen it, okay? So let's see how we kind of bring all of these together. So standardization, being able to compare stuff across the board. One way that we do this really, really well is something called the Northeast Snowfall impact scale or NESIS, all right? Now think about it. You've got snowfall in Rhode Island, snowfall in Maine, snowfall in Burlington. Are they all the same? Probably not. So this particular scale allows you to bring in snowfalls of at least 10 inches with populations around the entire Northeast and to be able to say, can I rank them one against the other? And so when I do that, I can actually figure out whether the storm systems, the snowfall systems, are actually getting more intense or have they pretty much stayed the same. So if you, can you see some of those numbers on there? One, two, three, four, five? Okay, those are the ranks. Can you see where it says fives and fours and threes? Can you see that, folks? All right, so those are the, 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 the categories that they fall under. And then the descriptions are things like whether it was a crippling storm. Did we need to shut down all of the major airports? Did we need to call in the National Guard? That would be an example of crippling, okay? And so the one that stands out and still stands out is the, the snowstorm of 1993. And that stands out because of its, of its spatial extent. That's the, the diagram on the, the lower right in here. See how much of New England was affected? It stands out because of the number of, of uh, closures and, and so forth. It also stands out because of its duration. And this event, folks, was so long lasting, it actually moved from the Gulf of Mexico up the um, eastern seaboard before it hit us, and it caused things like tornadoes along the way. So this is a particularly extreme event from a number of different perspectives. So we can actually rank that and explain why the bomb cyclone of January this year doesn't compare to this, okay? So we can actually figure out what's taking place in here. Ranking things like that also allows us to answer this question. How can you have a record snowfall? How can you have a, a snow event that produces 20 something inches of snow and the, the atmosphere is warming and climate is changing. How can you have both of those taking place at the same time? And so you think about it from a physics perspective, we can actually go through and, and understand why um, having record amounts of snowfall are still possible in, in a warming climate. So it allows us to kind of step on through and, and ask and understand that question. All right. So speaking of impacts, speaking of things like crippling snowstorms, um, a lot of these figures that I'm going to show you here are put together by David Valley, who is um, a, a lead forecaster at the National Weather Service in Taunton, Massachusetts. And what he's done is he's put together these slides that show you all of the hurricanes, all of the tropical systems that have passed through from about 1850 to 2016 or so within a 150 mile radius of Providence, 
Okay, so you're looking at these and you and you're seeing that there have been at least 115 of these storms. Like I said, we're going all the way through to, to tropical storms and all the way up to Cat 5, Category 5 storms. And there's a lot, right? Okay, there's a lot of stuff that's passed through across in here. I can dissect this and maybe just look at the ones that have been the highest impact, either the highest amount of precipitation or the most number of people affected, and that might look something like this. And you're reading through on here, and you might see some names that you recognize, stuff like um, Carol and Donna and Diane, okay? And then others that you get a little bit closer, uh, Hurricane or, or, or Tropical Storm Irene, a little bit closer in time. So we're looking at that, we're looking to see how those are in there, and we're also looking to see some of those anomalous types of, of tropical systems that did kind of loop de dupes Now, let's see if we can dissect this one more way. And this time, I'm going to break apart the last century. So 1900 to 1950, these are the storms and how they've tracked. Don't blink and don't look at me, look at the screen, because I'm going to show you the second part of the 20th century, and it looks like that. So let me go back and forth, and then we'll do a little bit of audience participation. What are you seeing? Are they exactly the same? One more time. Whoops. Exactly the same or not? All right, so I did it like this. What are you seeing? Changes in what? Changes in track. What else? Frequency, what else? One more. Intensity. So we're seeing changes in, in track, frequency, and intensity. Now, why, why does this matter? This matters because if you have never experienced a hurricane or a tropical system because of when or where, then that gives you a different type of, of vulnerability than if you had seen six or eight or ten in your life. All right, so we're looking to see this, this component in terms of when and where these are um, relative to where folks are. And then this is, of course, the last 15 years or so. Okay? So a couple of things that I kind of notice on here is that in the last 15 years, the, the Gulf of Mexico has become uh, a really, really hotbed for us to actually have these continue on through. Why does that matter? Because Hurricanes and tropical systems usually decay as they move over land, right? They don't have access to the ocean anymore. So when you see it actually long-lasting and continuing for that length of time and, and, and space, this tells you a lot about the strength and how much water was actually in the system as it kind of moved on through. Does that make sense, folks? Okay. And the other part about this is if they're all sort of coming like this, and up, so the Gulf of Mexico into here, they may or may not be starting over the Eastern Caribbean like they used to, all right? And so that's also going to be important because it, it, it makes a difference in terms of um, the preparedness and the exposure um, to, to hurricanes in different parts of the Atlantic slash Caribbean basin. So we're going to be using all of these different types of data to put them into a, a model that tells us a little bit more about the processes and the predictions or the projections that we can make for these different types of events. So if we're doing this on a short-term basis, then they're usually sort of weather models. So the stuff that you see either on your phone or uh, the nightly news, okay? If we're trying to see how, how systems could change later on in time, those are going to be um, climate change models that we're going to be looking at here. So let's see how that kind of shakes out. So these future models, the ones that tell you a little bit about um, projections out into the future, whether it's 20 years or towards the end of the century, the, these climate models, what they try to do is they try to put everything that we know about, remember, the atmosphere, the, l the oceans, the land, and the, the, the vegetation, all together in a way that, sh that explain to you the different processes that are in place. Can you see this okay? Can you read this okay? Do you like this diagram? Does it make sense to you? Sort of? Pardon? It looks like a hydrological cycle. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a thing. 
Okay. The only reason why I ask is because we as human beings do what's called social constructivism. It means that we latch on to what we already know. And so I asked you if that was a good thing or bad thing, is if, if a hydrologic cycle is good for you, then that would make it a little bit easier for you to understand, okay? All right, so this is what uh, all the climate models, if you raise up the hood and you look underneath, this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to model the uh, radiation, the water flow, the, the, the motion of winds across the Earth's surface from one place to the next. And some of them do it a little bit better than others. So we've been doing this for a while, okay? These climate models have been around for a while. And because there's that time element in there, as we move through time, we're getting a little bit better and better at understanding the processes. We're getting a little bit better at understanding the physics. And so the, the way that these models project out into the future is getting a little bit better and better. Okay, so that's one thing in here. The other thing is, can you see that there are more and more circles as we go through time? All right, what those circles represent are ways of, of adding additional information. So on the left-hand side here, it says atmosphere, land, and ocean, and sea ice. That's how we used to model the Earth. What are we missing? Anything to do with trees, right? So there were no trees in there whatsoever. We didn't do anything with trees. And as we went through time, if you look really carefully, you'll see how those are getting bigger and bigger. So that means our understanding is increasing and you're seeing how they're overlapping, which means that they're now talking to each other. So it's becoming more of a nice system. So there's a little bit more feedback going on through here. And so we're adding things like vegetation through carbon cycle. We're adding things like aerosols and so forth. So these are some of the ways that we can better um, show what the physical part of our Earth is doing. And as we're doing that, we're also adding a little bit more about the landscape. The Earth is not flat, is it? And so if we, if we know the Earth is not flat, we need to add the, 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 the topography, the elevation, to actually better capture what that is. So this is what things look like in 1990. And by the time we got to 2007, and the models have increased and improved, now this is supposed to be Western Europe and England. You see it looks a little more like that? because we've added in that additional piece in there. The other way that we can do this is something called downscaling. And what downscaling allows you to do is to, 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 to better model, better to capture the very, very tiny things like, you know the wind flow on Narragansett Bay, for example? Okay, the smaller patterns that you would not see if you were trying to do something across all of the Northeast. So we're able to kind of look at those really tiny events and, and be able to bring those into my models. So a lot of this modeling, as it improves over time, things start to look more like what the actual physical system is. And so um, regional climate models are a way of, of adding in some of those features. So that's, that's the sort of like, how do we know what we know? So that begs the question, what do we know? What are some of the things that we can say? And then what are some of the things that we still need to kind of work on a little bit? So the answer to what do we know depends on what are we asking? What's, what's the question of interest? What's the time of interest? What are we actually sort of looking at here? And so we're talking about severe events. We're talking about things like hurricanes and snowstorms and tornadic events and so forth. And so when you think about those, all of those have a certain set of characteristics. It, it can be things like, how long did it last? Or it can be things like, how big is it? Or it can be, how quickly does this come back? Or the size of it? And then how does this affect us as human beings? So we've got a couple ways of looking at this um, in terms of the actual size. Something like um, Hurricane Irene was 500 miles wide, okay? And that was, that was ginormous because it, it influenced a large land mass and a lot of rain that affected a lot of people. If you think about some of the other events that were a little bit smaller, what did we get instead? Tighter winds, right? You remember, if you ever look at things like figure skating, to, to skate faster, what do you do? You go from this to this, 
and you spin faster because you, you're decreasing that angular momentum, right? So when we look at these, the, the sort of diameter of it makes a big difference for us. The other thing that we look at is what's the track that occurred? And being a coastal location, you know it just takes a little bit of a difference, whether it's inland or offshore, to determine if you're going to get a snow event or a rain event. So that track makes a, a, a huge difference for us. Track makes a big difference not just in snowstorms, but also in, in um, hurricane tracks. In New England, this is the second thing that you're probably going to write down apart from systems. In New England, the heaviest rainfall tends to be on the left side <laughs> of your track. Okay, so it tends to be on the left side. So if you have a storm system that moves something like Hurricane Donna did, pretty much slicing across um, the eastern third or so, you know that most of that precipitation, the heavy precipitation, is going to be um, pretty much inland. Unlike something like Hurricane Bob, which was more of a coastal event, and so a lot of the inland regions were actually sort of spared that pre precipitation. So the track is going to be important for us in looking at that. A uh, couple other ways that we can kind of slice and dice this to, ask the, to answer that question is, how often is something occurring? How many of them are occurring? And then whatever else is there in, in here. So hurricanes that have actually struck uh, the U.S. from 1900 all the way through to 2016. And as you're looking at those, you're, you're noticing that there are times when there have been more hurricanes occurring closer together and then quieter times in here. You seeing that, folks? Okay. And part of the reason why we were seeing that is one of those teleconnections that we're going to talk a little bit about in a sec. Okay. The Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, how that, that has um, implications for the numbers of these hurricanes and, and how many of them actually occur in a given year. Okay, so I told you that there's some stuff that's literally hot off the press. So this, this, this uh, report came out last uh, Tuesday, the, the, the 6th of June. And the title of the report was, Hurricanes are slowing, which could be a big problem. And they're talking about the, the hurricanes. You know hurricanes usually will come and go off, and they're either anywhere from two to three days to about a week. They're looking at some of the hurricanes that we saw in 2017, where they came, and they were literally moving slowly. And the case of Harvey, see how Harvey did like this, and then came back like that, and then like did this again, and sort of slowed down and, and deposited like 50-something inches of rain over Houston? All right, so the question is, if they're slowing, why are they slowing? And if something slows down or stalls in place, it's going to have the chance to pour and pour and pour, right? And so understanding this question and understanding sort of like why we, we need to look at it is, is one of those pieces that we're looking at here. So here's um, Harvey. I'm going to play that just a couple more times for you to see. We're looking at Harvey here. And that's what we mean by slowing down and sort of stalling in place, okay? Anytime you've got that potential, you've got a, a particular amount of precipitation sort of ringing out itself. So slowing down is one piece. Another way of looking at this, if I say to you extreme precipitation, what sort of numbers do you have in your mind for extreme precipitation? Is it one inch of rain? Two? Depends on the time. Three? Four? 12? All right. 17? 17? Over a period of time. Okay. I'm glad you keep pointing that time element out in there because time is critically important with how much rain falls when and how quickly. Okay. So there's that time element that cri that's critically important. This time element here is not on the order of hours or days. This is a five year time period. Okay, so what you're looking at here is um, large amounts of precipitation. In the right-hand side, it is more than an inch of rain. On the left-hand side, it is more than three inches of rain over that uh, five-year time frame. And when you look at that, don't look at me, when you look at that, you'll notice, it should come as no surprise, that there are more events if it's only one inch, right, and fewer events if it's three inches. Okay, so knowing which um, uh, metric we're, we're using here 
helps us to kind of tease this out. So let's say we're talking about four inches. And let's say we're talking about four inches of rain that fell with all of these tropical systems. And again, this, this work is coming from David uh, Valley in Tawton, and looking to see when have these events with four inches, at least four inches of rain, occurred with tropical cyclones. And the stuff that's shown to you in red is when we're sort of pulling out most of these. And you'll notice that a lot of them have occurred since uh, 1999 or so, tropical storm Floyd, all right? So we're looking to see um, if we're talking about intensity from a number perspective, in this case, four inches or more, we're looking to see has the number of these events and the, the frequency sort of changed over time. Okay, so let's talk just very, very briefly then about hurricanes and, and, and climate change. So what are some of the pieces that we need to uh, kind of look at a little bit closer in here? Some of the things that we are learning about and understanding a little bit about are, you know, hurricanes and climate change, a very, very um, intricate system in here. And one piece is, of course, the, the oceans, because you, the, the fuel that comes from a, a hurricane is, of course, that evaporation that takes place from the ocean. So we need to look at, are the oceans warming? Are the oceans warming at the surface? Watch me for a sec. Katrina intensified over about this much worth of hot water. Okay, so it doesn't take a lot. What if the warming is actually occurring further deep into the ocean? How is that going to affect your um, intensification? So the amount of heat in the hot amount of heat in the oceans is a critical piece in that. The other critical piece is the oceans are critically important, but the atmosphere is also important. So for hurricanes to really, really develop, I need to put the mic down for a sec here. For hurricanes to really, really develop, they need to develop in a, in a nice, deep atmosphere. If there is anything that causes the top of that hurricane to get chopped off, like a change in your jet stream to cause it to get chopped off, then you can have the hottest ocean, but it won't develop into that towering um, cumulonimbus type of cloud that you need, all right? So looking at the, the, the coupling, that combination between what's taking place in your oceans, but also what's taking place in your atmosphere is gonna be important. So when we look at um, that, that relationship between the two, we're also looking to see at what the jet stream patterns are doing because with Harvey, the jet stream pattern was in what we call a blocking system, and that caused Harvey not to be able to kind of move as, as it would have had otherwise. So we're looking to see some of those pieces in here. And then the last thing that we're gonna look at with the atmosphere and the ocean combined is as the ocean heats up and you get a lot of that um, motion of, of latent energy into the atmosphere and you get all that bubbling, it also tends to cause the, the air to do like this. See that? Okay, that's called wind shear. So the, the ocean piece and the atmosphere piece are critically important in helping to put some of that together. So here's a, a, an animation that brings a lot of that stuff together from the uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab at Princeton. And as I play it, what you'll notice is that you're looking at places that are cold, water-wise, that's the blue, places that are warm, which is the red, and as it moves on through, sure, you're getting this um, creation of your, your thunderstorms, but at some point, that heat in the, in the, in the ocean is going to also sort of trigger a reaction in, in the atmosphere, and you're going to get that wind shear, okay? So a lot of, of, of uh, scientists who are looking at hurricanes are looking to see, is there a limit to the growth of hurricanes with having warm water and having that shear, and is there gonna be some limit at which that stops, All right? So I just got the five minute sign, it's probably down to two minutes right now, and I think this might be a good place to sort of wrap things up for a little bit in terms of some of the, the dynamics of what we wanted to, to sort of talk a little bit about and, and maybe um, throw out a little bit. We did a lot of Q&A as we were going through, but some of the pieces that I wanted to make sure that we actually had a chance to look at is, did you get a sense for 
that need to sort of look at all of the pieces so we don't miss anything that's one piece in here did you get a sense of the need to sort of look at it from different places different parts of the world the spatial element and looking at things at different times so that you understand what it is you're looking at in order to make a, a, a better determination of how things have actually changed okay so I'm not going to rush through to get to the end of my slides, just to say I did, but I wanted to sort of use those last few comments to kind of summarize things and, and bring them together. Okay. So I think I'm going to stop right there, and Sunshine does not have to give me the hook. <laughs> I don't, I'm not giving you the hook. No? You sure? I'm just, You're just standing up to say thank you. Okay. <laughs> Association, um, and you were talking about how it they they described that 2017 had the most costly hurricanes. Do you know if that took into account the fact that we have more infrastructure on the East Coast um, versus like in the past, and that might make things more costly with respect to the past? I do not recall if they did or not, but that is one of the best points because it comes back to that um, exposure of risk and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. that part of it is because we now live in places that probably should not be lived in. Yeah. And part of it is because not only are we there, but we put up more expensive infrastructure, mm -hmm. whatever the definition of infrastructure is. And so when that infrastructure is lost and we, we think about either rebuilding or relocating, then the price tag is larger than it would have been 50 or 60 years ago. Absolutely. But I, can, I can go back and double check if they did or not, but they probably did normalize it. Absolutely. You could make that um, blanket statement. So thank you. No problem. So I'm worried about um, uh, the, the heating of the atmosphere. With the heating of the atmosphere, are we uh, getting these high pressure domes, and are they getting bigger and harder to break up? All right, so part of the answer to that question is one of the, the ways that we, we, we understand how the um, high pressure and low pressure patterns are, are getting stuck, if you want to use that word, is something called um, the Arctic amplification, which is the relationship between what's going on at the poles and what's going on here in the mid latitudes. And usually, the, the sort of difference between the poles and us is a nice steep gradient, right? And stuff stays at the poles and stuff stays down here. When you have the, the, the Arctic region warming faster than everywhere else in the world, the, the difference between them and us has now become like this. And so there's less of that difference between the two, and the end result is that the jet stream does a little bit more meandering back and forth. So it looks more like uh, a snaking river as opposed to um, being straight, it does this looping instead. And when it does that, it means that it's harder, if you have a loop de dupe it's harder for a system to kind of try and, and break through that because the jet stream controls the way that storms move. So unless that, that jet stream pattern um, changes and moves on out after a few days, weeks, or months, then that storm system sits there in place. Right. During, during hurricane season. Mm -hmm. And so typically, at least before, we would have hurricanes that would come in and, and go into the interior of the United States and peter out. But now they're bouncing off the high pressure dome and they're going up the coastline where they have access to water and they continue to, they come up to here in, the, the, in New England. Right. And so that part of that is a sort of reinforcement of the pattern because if, if I can find a really quick slide to just 
I just need a slide of, all right, so something like this, where you're talking about the dome across in here, and then a low pressure in here, so things kind of move up like that. What that is, 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 is literally sort of um, reinforcing what we usually have on the East Coast, which is that sort of low pressure region. So having that high pressure region in, in the, the mid part of the country set up partly because of the jet stream pattern is just literally reinforcing what, the, what it would usually be. So it's kind of like a double whammy. And then when you have the jet stream reinforcing that, remember on the, uh, on the, on the ocean you have the, the Gulf Stream. So you're passing over really warm water in here. So it's the atmosphere interacting with the warmth of the Gulf Stream giving you a, like a triple whammy. Um, yeah, I, I was curious, uh, so you're the state climatologist uh, of Vermont, and I'm curious to know what uh, you think the priorities in terms of adaptation are in Vermont, and perhaps what uh, Vermont legislators have pioneered uh, in terms of adaptation to uh, weather extremes. Okay, so he, he asked me that um, as in my role as a state climatologist, what, my, what I think the priorities are for adaptation in the state, and what was the second part? Uh, if Vermont has pioneered anything that's unique, if Vermont has pioneered anything that's unique, um, I think I, I'm in a particularly fortunate position that about two, 15 or, or 18 years ago, the, from the governor level down, there was this mandate that came out that state agencies uh, consciously factor in changing climate in their uh, strategic plans on a five-year and ten-year time frame. And so there have been um, adaptation events taking place from that perspective. Uh, parallel to mitigation as well, so mitigation in terms of reduction of the greenhouse gases in terms of um, clean the Clean Air Act and how that uh, translates to um, policies on the ground um, in terms of emissions from different types of, of, of cars. Vermont follows the California <laughs> um, rule in terms of, of emissions from, from cars and so um, in terms of pioneering stuff, I think before I even got involved in all of this, there was a lot of sort of foresight and forethinking from a legislative perspective. So my job is to, to help support that in whatever shape or form. So I, I don't need to literally um, go out and, and do anything in particular because the state's been pro so proactive. It's not really a question, but just looking at the map, I don't see where any hurricanes have actually intersected with Vermont. Wow, okay. So um, hurricanes in Vermont, no, you may not see it from here. Uh, 1938, it came straight up the Hudson and into uh, Lake Champlain Valley. Um, 1927, the system had already decayed and it merged with a cold front and that actually produced the floods of record. So it was a post-tropical system in there. Um, we had a number of events in the late 1800s that you may not see on here because they weren't a category four, five, or six, which is what a lot of, no, okay. there's no such thing as a six yet. Okay. But a, a lot of the, the tropical systems when they decayed, they still move into there. Irene tracked up the um, Connecticut River and straight up. And then tropical uh, storm Floyd actually tracked across through us and produced 14 inches on our highest peak, not a stitch of flooding because it was a drought year. So if, if I had, if I had um, redone this and said all of the systems within 100 miles of Burlington, you would have caught all of those because this is, is 150 miles um, around Providence, so there's some that you're not gonna catch. Um, yeah, that's what it is too. All right. mm -hmm. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Dupini Giro. This was just a really fascinating talk and you did such a nice job of pulling it all together, so thank you.